This episode of Tape Fact is sponsored by Chocolate Moose. Now made with real meese. I don't think that's the right plural, man. Titanium is the first member of the transition metals, and boy, what a first member it is. Titanium metal is strong, abundant, lighter than iron, less dense than aluminium, and if you rearrange its name, you can make I am nutty, which isn't useful, but I thought it was pretty neat. Over 40% of all titanium metal in circulation is used in the aerospace industry. Most planes in service today, from the Boeing 737 to the B-2 Stealth Bomber, contain loads of titanium in their airframes, engines, and landing gear. But you might not know there's also a fair bit of titanium in the pages of those glossy, fluff-filled magazines stuffed in the backseat pockets. For over half a century, the most common pigment in white paint and ink has been titanium white. The previous frontrunner, lead white, has been used in paint since the time of the ancient Greeks, but it was banned for sale in the developed world when doctors realised it was turning people's brains into Campbell's chunky soup. Titanium white, meanwhile, is non-toxic, and you can find it in everything from white paper to white makeup to the white house paint that millennials compulsively slather over every countertop item of furniture and family pet in their house. Unlike stainless steel, titanium is practically impervious to saltwater corrosion, a property that did not go unnoticed during the Cold War. In the 1960s, the USSR developed the Alpha class of submarines. Small, agile craft covered in highly reflective sheets of titanium alloy. When CIA operatives first laid eyes on the Alpha, bobbing merrily in the waters of Leningrad like a shiny communist sausage roll, it must have absolutely terrified them. Back then, the Americans knew about as much about making titanium submarines as the Scottish did about staying sober past 2pm so finding out the Russians had cracked it first came as a massive blow. Titanium submarines were strong, lightweight, and blazingly fast. The Papa, another titanium submarine developed by the Soviets, was capable of reaching top speeds of 44.7 knots, and it's still the fastest submarine in history to this day. To make matters worse, the titanium industry of the 1960s was kept in a chokehold by the Soviet Union, due to massive deposits of titanium ore in Russia and Kazakhstan. The USSR was so dominant that the Americans had to secretly buy titanium from the Soviets to make spy planes, which they then used to spy on the Soviets. So if titanium submarines are so great, how come we've mostly ditched them in favour of filthy capitalist steel? There are a few reasons for this, chief among them that working with titanium was like unclogging a shower drain with the flat side of your tongue. The titanium alloy used by the Soviets was expensive, and could only be worked with under an inert atmosphere of argon gas. The shipyards had to be extensively cleaned and filled with specialist equipment, and the workers had to undergo heaps of training to be even allowed near the subs with a barge pole. Also, while the Alpha was fast, it was also so deafeningly loud. So by the time you picked up a decent speed, your enemy sonar systems would have heard you coming from five star systems away. Alpha-class submarines were powered by small state-of-the-art nuclear reactors, cooled with a molten mixture of lead and bismuth. As well as being more efficient than traditional water-cooled reactors, lead bismuth coolants were safer for underwater travel, because in the case of a leak, the metal would just solidify and terminate the reaction. Problem is, the reactors had to be kept warm, because if the liquid ever cooled below 125 degrees Celsius, the coolant would immediately solidify, and could be only turned back by spraying the engine with superheated steam. Not exactly ideal if you're, uh, well, I don't know, stranded at the bottom of the ocean. Titanium was discovered in 1791 by a Cornish clergyman by the name of William Greger. Outside of his clerical duties, Reverend Greger was an amateur mineralogist, and when he wasn't busy preaching the gospel to the godless hellspawn of Cornwall, he spent his time collecting and analysing precious stones. While strolling by a river in the parish of Manacken, Greger discovered a deposit of strange black sand that he later discovered to be magnetic. Greger believed the sand was a mixture of two metal oxides, the first containing containing iron, explaining the magnetism, the second containing something else. Gregor named the mineral Manaconite after the parish in which it was discovered, but four years passed and word of a new element did not reach the ears of the German chemist Martin Heinrich Klaproth, who independently discovered titanium in 1795. At least, I think he did. I wanted to double check this date just to be thorough, so I went back to the books and I'm pleased to announce that all my research has just made me more cranky and annoyed than I was when I started. This book by Emsley, this book by Kishaway and Husseini, and this book by Lutyering and Williams say that Klaproth discovered titanium in 1795, but this book by Krebs says it was in 1793, and Klaproth's Wikipedia page says it was 1792, without citing a source. I did eventually find a primary source from 1795, a treatise in inorganic chemistry written in 18th century German, but scientific historians, get your house in order, please. Three years is a pretty big gap. That's enough time to make like 900 episodes of Emmerdale, or for me to upload like five new videos. Klaproth was one of the most scientifically rigorous chemists of his day, and is now considered to be one of the fathers of modern analytical chemistry. While Gregor was a total newcomer to discovering elements, and spoiler alert, he wouldn't discover any others in the future, Klaproth was 
something of a seasoned veteran, having discovered uranium and zirconium in the 1780s. Klaproth gave Element 22 the much cooler name of Titanium, after the Titans of Greek mythology. The guys that ruled the heavens of ancient Greece, you know, before Zeus booted them down to Tartarus to make way for another embroidered leather sex bench. So whether you're a Soviet submarine designer or an Anglican priest or on a bombing campaign over the Third World, Titanium will have something for you. This is probably the last D-block metal most non-chemists will recognise till we get to iron, but don't worry, there's plenty of interesting chemistry to come. Now as the famous 2011 pop song goes, Shoot me down, but I won't fall... well, actually I will, so please don't shoot me. 